Hello everyone, this is Professor McLaughlin. Um, this is a introductory lecture for legal research and writing, um, spring 2016. Um, I'd like to talk generally about the course, but also um, go through these slides in chapter one, talk a little bit about the book. Um, um, but to begin with, talk about what you can expect from this class, what my expectations are, and then where it fits in your paralegal education and where writing um, and research fits in uh, your practice as a paralegal, legal assistant, or um, com regulatory compliance person, um, whatever the job, even law clerk, uh, clerk, receptionist. Um, I want to continue to emphasize in this program that um, for and, and have you all be ambassadors for the idea that the title of your job, whatever it is after you finish the program, whatever it is now if you're currently working in the legal field, is um, not as important as what you're doing um, for lots of different reasons. Law firms, corporations, mostly law firms, are titling jobs specifically so that they can bill in a particular way. It's really for the law firm driven by the legal consumer, driven by the client. Um, corporations, uh, they'll probably title the position uh, paralegal legal assistant. Um, but even with jobs I've seen at the county and um, certainly corporations where your work would not be in the legal department, but maybe in another department um, that has to comply with laws or has to comply with regulations or, um, uh, you know, that kind of compliance uh, arena. And sometimes you're in compliance and the word compliance isn't, isn't even in your job title or the department you're working in. So I, I would like you all to begin to free your minds and Take a look around as you attend Orange County Paralegal Association events and look for jobs that um, you begin to see that we're in a, a state that regulates business heavily. We're in a country that has growing levels of regulation. We're in a county that does a lot of international um business and so that adds another layer of regulation so you may find after you finish the, the, this certificate as you go forward that the title of the job uh, isn't quite as important as the skills you're obtaining in this class um, so and then now let me finally get to my point which is the legal writing skills this book focuses on um, litigation and law firm writing but our research, um, and that's fine, it's good to know, and it's traditional, and that's a good traditional way to train a paralegal legal assistant. But our research activities are going to um, help broaden your thinking a little bit, looking at regulations, uh, activities that require you to look up regulations in the state of California, compare those regulations with other states, and they may regulate the environment, or tax regulations, ah, uh, boring, but super interesting if you know how to look them up. Um, and so much of law today is available online for lots of reasons, but some of it is still only available in books or databases that you have to pay or subscribe to. And so you'll receive a, a Westlaw next code in this class earlier than I have given out previously because I find that if I give it out too late the students don't use it but I want to really give it out like next week and have you using it all semester long learning to use it understanding it um, your assignments will be to do the, the um, um, tutorials 
I made them optional in the past, and we have a saying at the community college now that students don't do optional. So now it will be an assignment, and you'll screenshot completion of that tutorial and send that to me as proof that you went through it. Um, but what you're really training in this class, uh, we're going to do a lot of nitty-gritty writing, grammar, um, understanding how lawyers and the legal profession likes to express itself, and then also um, practice uh, legal research skills. And so I've also found this is my sixth year of teaching this course. Well, longer than that. I taught it um, before I got this job. Um, over 10 years teaching this class uh, and conducting a lot of legal research. That students may be very good at Google, but this takes your ability to search um, and find uh, what you're looking for to the next level. Because now you have to also analyze it. Is this the best result? Um, not trusting Google to return the best result, but relying on yourself. Because at the end of the day, if you submit something to the court and the case is out of date, you've lost. Um, if the other side has uh, all the recent research and um, you have failed to find out if your case is the most recent, maybe that case was overturned, um, then that's a, a big problem. And, and lawyers rely on paralegals and um, uh, at whatever level you are in your, uh, as a legal assistant or compliance um, person, um, somebody's delegating to you the duty to do the research. And, um, and it also can be super fun. It is like law and order forensics, trying to find the needle in the haystack and really um, searching and trying to find the best answer. And so hopefully we can have some fun. Um, students don't always have fun in this class. Um, but it is a, a part of the legal profession and your, your practice as a legal assistant and as a paralegal that can be tedious but very rewarding. Um, I always learn something when I do research, even if it's, even if I never really got to the result I was looking for. Um, you're, you're acquiring information and the more you practice, you're also honing and perfecting your research skills. I, I searched these terms and I got really funny results. And that's, you know, why was that? Is it because I needed to take off the parentheses? Um, and searching on Google is going to be so different. I'm going to have you searching on the um, databases that you get uh, through the IVC library. Lots of information there. We're going to do it on Westlaw as well. Um, okay, so that's kind of a flavor for what we're doing this semester. Let me focus. So this is a picture of the book. Hopefully uh, you have it by now. It is a very good book. It trains you. The assignments train you in many, many ways. The assignments are structured to help you think like a legal professional. They have subparts. There are subparts to the subparts, and you have to read it carefully and answer the questions. So um, if you start getting assignments back saying you didn't answer all the questions, you're going to go back and say, huh, how did I miss that? Um, how could I highlight better? How could I underline better that um, question uh, in order to get um, the best response? Okay, so let's move on. So legal research analysis and writing. Um, so you have your book, you have this book, which is great. And then you also, um, I encourage you to look up words you don't know, use the glossary in this book. There's lots of online legal dictionaries. And also that you're going to be learning new words. And part of um, the law is understanding, it's learning a new language. So don't despair Find a technique that works for you to acquire the language. Uh, if you don't, I, I I was on a phone call with a bunch of lawyers uh, last week, and someone used a Latin phrase, and I was like, what did that mean? And he's like, oh, and he explained it to me and felt um, happy to teach me something, and I was happy to learn something. So uh, if you don't understand the word, and then and now I know it, and I will use it. 
um, so I can practice it. So acquiring those um, abilities in some of your classes, I encourage you to practice in your contracts and torts class. And, and law is very language-based. It, it is very specific. Um, lawyers aren't super versatile. They use the same words over and over. And that's for a reason. Maybe it's because lawyers are limited. Um, but it's also so that we all understand that we're talking about the same thing, so that there's no confusion. When I use this word, we all know what that person means. Um, and very few words in law or phrases have dual meanings, and that's on purpose. So when I use a phrase and I use a legal word, we know exactly what it means. Um, I'm not, it, 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 it doesn't mean anything else but this. So ambiguity, lawyers hate ambiguity, courts hate ambiguity, contracts hate ambiguity, clients hate ambiguity, and we fight it. And we fight ambiguity in the law by being very specific about what we mean and what we say. Um, sometimes it takes three sentences to say something. Sometimes it only takes a phrase, and that will capture the concept, the legal concept that I'm trying to get at in my writing. So use a legal dictionary, keep track of phrases and words, um, save them on your phone, open up a Word doc, however you want to do that. Um, use a glossary. And use those words in your assignments. If you're learning new words in your other classes, throw them in my assignments. I try and give you assignments that um, overlap with your other classes. It doesn't always work, but um, practice using those words uh, while you're uh, in the program. Legal thesaurus, I use a thesaurus all the time. Readers get bored using the same word over and over in a document or an essay or in your writing or your assignment is boring. Practice using different words. Um, just play around with the thesaurus on your on your software, your word processing software, whatever you use. Um, it comes up with another word that could replace this word. And maybe it is a better word. And maybe there is no better word. Maybe you chose the right word. But we'll do a lot of that word choice. Um, we'll do a lot of, I'll, 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 I don't want to say criticize, but I'll critique you on the words you chose and um, ask if there's a better way to put that. And don't forget, we're practicing, practicing, practicing here. Um, this is, you're not a final product. You're building toward the final product. And I'll tell you, my writing improves. The more I write, it improves over time. And um, it's a skill, and you're practicing it and learning it. So uh, you're not going to come out a finished product, but hopefully what you're getting are the tools that you need to perfect this skill, to learn the skill, perfect it, and practice it um, after you leave the program. Uh, learn how to use an index. It's really important. I use them all the time. Learn what an index is if you don't know. Look at the index in this book. Look in the index in all your books, in all your classes. See how it's organized. See how it's broken down. What do you do if the word, if the um, idea or concept you're looking for isn't in the d index of your book? Um, does that mean it's not in the book? No. Sometimes they don't put everything in the index. But these are good opportunities for you to practice some of these skills. So the legal research process, what you see these four bullet points is really uh, IRAC. The, um, let's see if I can... Uh, it's the I, the issue. You're going to find, and instead of law, we like to say rule. Let me add that. And analyze the A. And then communicate our findings, which is also another way to say conclusion. So IRAC, it is a tool for organizing your ideas, your thoughts, your um, paragraph, your research, your, um, sorry, fooling around with fonts. Fonts are fun. Um, 
you'll find that most court cases are organized, court opinions are organized according to IRAC. As you read, I want you to begin to practice in your brain identifying what's the issue or idea that's being discussed. So identify the issue. Um, what's the rule that's being applied to the facts of this client's problem or this hypothetical? And then the analysis. This is so difficult to learn to do, and we're going to practice this. And you may struggle with the analytical part, but we're just going to keep practicing it all semester until you start, begin to get a handle on it. Analysis, things like comparing and contrasting concepts. You analyze all the time. Am I, when you go to the grocery store, I'm choosing the least expensive. Is that more expensive? I'm comparing. Um, I'm looking for something that's low sodium. I'm looking for something that's spicy. You're distinguishing between things. So analysis of the law is no different. You're looking at two items, two products, two laws. You're going to compare and contrast what's for my case, what's against my case. And then you're also going to do what the book calls predictive analysis, which is, well, you know, this has nothing to do with my client's case, but it's just a new law. And I want to understand how would the court decide a case based on this new piece of legislation or this new law. So analysis will begin to develop those skills, distinguishing, comparing and contrasting, um, identifying differences, strengths and weaknesses, looking for ambiguity. Is the law unclear? That's an analytical Conclusion, this law is unclear, it's ambiguous. How is it going to be applied? Um, and then communicating findings, just concluding. And that doesn't mean getting to the right answer. What if your conclusion is, I need more information before I can conclude? That's your conclusion. I want you to write that in your assignment and put that down. Your conclusion may be, um, this area is very confused. The laws are very conflicting. It's difficult to determine how a court would apply this. That might be your conclusion. Um, sometimes students uh, struggle with finding things online or, or finding the law that they were looking for, and I want that in. I want that communicated in your conclusion and your findings. Um, the law was very difficult to find uh, in this particular um, area. Um, more research is needed, more time would be needed, that kind of thing. We'll get into that as we get into specific assignments. So the legal research process, um, identifying the issue or the factual question raised by the client's problem, finding the rule that applies to that factual question, and then analyzing the law in relationship to that factual question. Putting the law on one side of your paper and the hypothetical or the facts on the other side of the paper. Where, what are these two things? How do they relate? And then communicating that in a finding. Fun stuff. Okay, so the research assistant is providing information to the attorney or the client trying to be accurate and thorough. I've completely researched this area. This is what I came up with. Um, paralegal responsibilities would be verifying facts, getting medical records, getting the police report, um, getting a copy of that contract. Uh, looking at the business license that's filed with the city or the state and verifying the information on it, looking at the tax return, and then summarizing relevant law. How is, what does the tax law say? What does the, uh, how is this business organized in the state of California? Um, does this uh, police report uh, provide additional information that the client, or does it verify what the client said? Drafting legal memoranda, which would which we're going to do in this class, which is really um, summarizing everything, really doing IRAC in a memoranda, which is just a terminology for a document that we call it a legal memo that describes how the law applies in this case or might predict how the court might decide in this case. And then checking legal citations. This semester in particular, we're going to really work on learning uh, the blue book, which is the rule book for legal citations, and it's the rule book for citing in 
uh, legal publications and also documents that are filed with the court. So we'll do a little bit of that. We'll do a lot of that. What are the ethical considerations? I'm sure this won't be the first time you've heard these, but as a research assistant, you're not allowed to give legal advice. You don't want to. Do you want to be responsible for that? No. If you do give legal advice, it's the unauthorized practice of law in the state of California, and it's a violation of the code. It's an ethical violation. It's unethical. Um, only lawyers can give legal advice, and that's a good thing. Um, and it's illegal, meaning it's a code violation. And uh, um, so um, in memoranda, in letters to clients, avoiding making a legal uh, conclusion in phone conversations with clients, always saying, well, well, we'll have to talk to the attorney about that or you can talk to the attorney about that, making sure you're careful and within your ethical framework. Um, brief overview, hopefully um, this is covered in some of your other classes. Um, the U.S. legal system, and if if not, come take Management 12A because um, we cover it in the in the beginning of that course. It's um, fundamental to understanding how uh, the U.S. legal system works and how the judiciary works as well. So we have two separate governments, federal and state, and they share power. We call that federalism. Um, we're not a monarchy. Uh, we're not um, any other form of government. We're a federalist form of government where we have in the U.S. Constitution and the state constitution delineated powers. Some are reserved to the federal government. Some are reserved only to the states and some are shared by both. And what this um, automatically should get you looking at is when I have a hypothetical that potentially could have federal law apply to it and state law apply to it, I want to look at both. If I have environmental law case, I want to make sure that my client is um, covered by federal law or, or understanding what federal law might apply, what state law might apply, what city ordinance might ap apply if there is a recycling issue. Um, so we want to look at all of that. Where do you find law? So primary sources of law versus secondary sources of law. We have primary sources of law, and we distinguish between them because courts rely on primary sources of law to make decisions and can be pers uh, can can be reference secondary uh, sources to bolster a primary source argument or provide additional information, but the court will never make its decision based only on secondary law. I say never. Uh, imagine maybe a, like a brand new cutting edge area of law like artificial intelligence or um, there may be, if an area is brand new and completely unregulated, space law, some issue comes up in space. Um, secondary sources might be relied upon, um, but I bet even in that situation, they would find a primary source that's analogous and rely on that to make a decision. So primary sources of law, constitution, state and federal, cases, state and federal, if they apply, statutes, codes, state and federal, and then administrative regulations. Um, we're very governed by administrative legs, regs, the IRS, uh, employment law, uh, the EEOC. Um, there's a lot of administrative leg regulations that regulate us on a personal and business um, uh, level. So where, where are my secondary sources? Dictionaries, journals, encyclopedias. And we're going to take a trip to the, well, you're going to take a trip. Uh, I'm happy to meet you guys there, but um, to the law library at, on campus. And um, if I can get uh, another law library to let us visit, we could do that as well. Uh, sometimes they're not very um, uh, welcoming for that kind of thing. But that's okay. It would just be a fun additional trip if, if people were available. And um, in there, we'd identify secondary sources and primary sources of law, the case books and the encyclopedias. 
Um, and you find all this law in different forms, in print form and electronic form. And um, electronic could be subscription service, a CD-ROM, a uh, um, Westlaw Next, or maybe the Internet. So why even bother going through uh, books if everything's online? I'll tell you why. Under the, the, anything you find online is based on the book, how it was originally published in the book. Citations are referring to books, book pages, volume numbers, um, Unless there's a legal revolution and they, they, uh, do away with libraries and never publish another case, if all the trees are gone, uh, maybe a hundred years from now, uh, they'll come up with a new citation, a new way of referencing cases that are electronic only. But right now, and for your purposes, citations and understanding how the books are organized, it's very important to understanding research where you're going to find things online as well. And I'll begin to show you um, what that is and how that is. So tables of contents, tables of cases, tables of statutes, understanding what those are, how we use them, and where they show up um, is part of this course as well. Forward slide. Here we go. Okay, citing to the law. So these final slides, taking a look at how we cite to the law. And that's a big part of what paralegals do. Getting the citations correct is so important. An incorrect citation could lose um, time, money. Will it lose the case? I mean, potentially, sure. Um, getting the citation correct is, is uh, if, if the citation is wrong, did you cite to the wrong case? Did you mean another case? I mean, it really depends on what, um, uh, it, it depends on what the error is. So we're going to learn how to cite. We're going to practice citing. And that's the, these final slides. So the leading authority for legal citation, how we refer to other, how we refer to things we relied upon when we made a statement. Um, lawyers don't like original thought. No, 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 no original thought. I want to say, you know what? I didn't make this up. Some big smart person from Harvard made it up. Some big smart judge made this idea up. And I, I'm just referring to it. I'm just citing to it. I'm referencing it. Um, because why would you believe me as a lawyer or I'm just making a point? Instead, let me show you the hundreds of other jurists and legal scholars who said this thing, which is why you should decide in my favor or why this point is right. So that's the whole point of citation is saying, I didn't make this up. Matter of fact, people have been thinking this and relying upon this concept and this legal theory for centuries. Okay. Leading authority is the uniform system of citation. It's called the Blue Book or the Harvard Blue Book, and it was published by Harvard Law Review Association. I think the 20th edition came out. We'll look at it online. Uh, the 20th edition of the book came out a couple of months ago. Um, but it's a book, and it says how we cite things, how we reference cases, journals, that kind of thing. Uh, other citation, the Association of Legal Writing Directors. I don't, and local co court rules for sure. Um, I don't do a lot of ALWD citation, but let's look into it this semester. Just kind of uh, take a look at it. But definitely local court rules will tell you what the form of the citation should be as well. And we'll definitely look at that. So blue book rule 10 citation. So the blue book is a uniform citation book by Harvard. We call it the blue book. It has rules and those rules have numbers. Rule 10 is about citing to cases. So these final slides are really going to break down the citation so you understand what each stands for. So Roe v. Wade, it's the party. The plaintiff is or the, uh, this is a Supreme Court case. The complainant is um, Roe. The respondent is Wade. Claimant, 
defendant. Parties' names. Sometimes there's multiple parties. Sometimes there's lots of parties. In a class action, there's so many parties, you just say at all. Sometimes it's a corporation. Sometimes it's a John Doe. Sometimes it's a U.S. government. So the parties' names. Next part of the citation, the 410. What is that? It's referring to the volume number of a book. It's the 410th volume of the reporter. And the reporter is what we call the set of books where U.S. Supreme Court decisions are published. It's the U.S. reporter, and there's other reporters. There's regional reporters and state reporters and Supreme Court reporters and lawyers edition. So right now you're like, okay, that's a reporter. We call that book a reporter. So when I hear somebody talking about the reporter, I know it's not a journalist. It's a book where cases are published, and there's all different kinds. The 113 is the page number. Okay, it's the first page of the opinion of that case. It starts on page 113 in volume 1, volume 410 of the U.S. Reporter. And the case was published in 1973, probably also decided in 1973, definitely decided in 1973. But it would have probably gone up to the Supreme Court before that. So sometimes you'll see different... Uh, um, years, and you want to make sure you have the year of the case right, because Roe v. Wade went up the court system, um, and uh, there'll be previous year cases. Um, so this will be the year it was decided by the U.S. Supreme Court. So other citations, the Blue Book talks about how we refer to the U.S. Constitution. This is the citation for that. That's how you refer to uh, 14th Amendment. Yes, I had to double check. Don't read Roman numerals. And that's how we refer to a code section. That's the section um, symbol. And it's the Title 28 of the United States Code. And then we'll have the year here. So we're going to practice with putting these in our writing referring to citations, practicing that, getting it right, because knowing citations is a great asset to you when you're looking for a job, but also when you're reading documents and when you're day-to-day -day, um, reading law. Um, you understand that that's, immediately understand that's a code, all right, because you know that it's USC, United States Code. And you know that this means Constitution. So it's the U.S. Constitution. Could be California Constitution. So we're going to practice with that kind of stuff. So that's the last slide. Um, this is just an introductory, introductory lecture on uh, Chapter 1. Make sure you're getting the book this week and also doing the activities that you find in Blackboard. Okay, I'll see you guys online.